welcome to a, a new semester of our Heritage Discipleship Institute. We have a couple new students here tonight, and I think, and another one is on their way. So that's that is good, and we're glad to have some of the the faithful flock there online as well. And uh, thank you all for joining in with us tonight. This will be a class in the New Testament survey. So we have three New Testament survey classes. This is New Testament survey one. So our goal in this class is to survey the gospels and the book of the Acts and give some introductory information about New Testament times. So I believe this will be very encouraging and helpful for our spiritual growth and our understanding of God's word together. So as we begin, I would like to ask Micah if you could, you could pray for us and let me, um, I don't know, what, what do I have to do here to mute? I'll okay. Dear Lord, I just pray. Do you want to maybe turn off your volume? Oh, yeah, Sorry. <laughs> okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you so much, Lord, for the beginning of this new semester, Lord. I just um, really, even just on a personal level, Lord, I thank you that for so many semesters now, I've been able to learn so much from these classes, God. And I just pray that each student whose heart desires to learn, um, Lord, will be fulfilled. Lord, I pray that you give pastor your spirit as he teaches us, Lord, the word of God. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so uh, as we begin, if you will please just take your syllabus and go to page number two, and I'll just make a couple general statements about the class here. And, and the first thing is, is don't be afraid of the quizzes or the tests. I what I will do is send out a study guide before the quiz and the test to, to help you know exactly what to study because there will be a lot of information in the notes and you don't have to know every little point on the notes I'll, I'll basically tell you the things that you have to know so there are a couple of memory verses though if you look on page two in that syllabus and the, the this is the the classes that we're having and the first memory verse is matthew chapter 28 verse 19 and the second one would be verse 20 okay so and also another important piece of information is, and this is not in your, or maybe it's on the written one that I think I printed out for you here. But for those of you on Zoom, February 6th, there will not be a class. I will actually be out of town. I have to go to a conference that week. So I'll just be out of town the first part of that week. So February 6th, no class, but try to stay up with the reading. There is a good bit of reading in this class. You notice like for next week, you're supposed to start at page 15 and then read through page 37. So it's a good bit of reading, but I personally think it's very interesting and it's very helpful. And we'll, we'll go through some of it together. Although this first section is very general, really related to the whole New Testament. So uh, the first part, the first section, really we're not gonna probably deal with very much in this class, but it's good to read that. The first quiz in this class will be February 20th. So if you would mark that into your, into your syllabus notes, February 20th, that's where quiz one will be in this class. And another thing we, we like to do, and we find it very helpful and beneficial to the students is have a very, uh, is have a class presentation. And that's an oral presentation of seven to 10 minutes in length. And what you could do is, and I put this here, oral class project on page two, you see at the top, you can analyze and just give a brief presentation on one of the teachings of Jesus, a discourse. So what's a discourse? Like the Sermon on the Mount or the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, or you could, do an analysis of one of his parables or one of his miracles or anything that you would like from the book of the Acts as well. So that would just be seven to 10 minutes in length, which is pretty short, but that's, that's what we would like. So 
if you're going to take both classes as we did last semester you can just just one oral presentation so you can pick which class you would like to do a presentation from either from this class or the history class so you, you don't have to do two presentations just one presentation um, even if you do both of the classes okay and I'll tell you where the other quizzes are going to be as we go through but right now I think I told you that's the important things no class on February 6th quiz on February 20th oral presentation and please do your readings because I, I think that's that's very helpful all right any questions or comments about that Yeah, if you're auditing the class, you could just come and listen. That's all. You, you, I'm not going to ask you to take any quizzes, tests, do readings, or do any oral presentation if you're doing, if you're auditing the class. You're just listening. And you can ask questions. If you're auditing the class, you can participate in the class just as much as anyone could participate in the class as well, though. Okay. So I don't want you to feel if you're auditing, you can't ask a question. Definitely don't think that. You may. Okay, Eugene? I know for sure you're auditing. I don't know who else might be. Okay, so as we begin, let's just, let's open up our Bible and let's, let's go to the Gospel of Matthew and if you could look at Matthew chapter uh, four, and we'll just look at one verse here as we begin in Matthew chapter four, and I'm gonna try to find the verse. In verse number 17, Matthew chapter four and verse number 17. So we're gonna, we'll survey the gospel of Matthew first, and I just want to show some kind of a unique little feature in, in Matthew's gospel where he gives kind of the, the chapter breakdown of the gospel of Matthew. So these are the, be the kind of things that we, we will hopefully learn and focus on. So Matthew is broken up into three main sections, the first section, chapter one through chapter four, and verse number 17. So, Raul, could you read that verse for us, please? Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. What does it say? From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, so that's a marker when he says, From that time. And it's a change, a change of action of Jesus Christ. From that time, he began to preach, Repent. So, now look at Matthew chapter 16. And Matthew chapter 16, and this is right after Peter makes that great confession of faith. Remember when he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So I'm going to ask Sister Liz, if you could get that scripture for us, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, Liz. Okay, verse 21 says, from that time forth began Jesus to shew unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. Okay, so the first part of Matthew, again, it's, a, it's the presentation of Jesus Christ. He is, he is presenting himself as the virgin born son of God as the king of Israel. And then he begins to preach in Matthew chapter four. It says from that time forth, he began to, to preach the kingdom of heaven. So it was the proclamation. So it, it's the presentation to the proclamation. But now in, in this, it's, he, he says, I'm gonna tell you of my passion. So it's not just preaching. He's, he told them that he was gonna suffer on the cross, his passion. So. The, the, that's the three main markers, and we'll, we'll get there when we're in Matthew. I just wanted to give that to you as we begin here tonight, as we begin this study in New Testament survey. Okay, so in your notes on page three, we're going to look at some introductory material, 
And the first thing we want to see here in this introduction is the intertestamental period. So when we say intertestamental, we're saying the period of time between the Old Testament when Malachi was complete and when Matthew was begun to be written. It's 400 years of time. Now, what can happen in 400 years? A lot. 400 years is longer than the United States has been in existence as a nation. So it's a, it's a long period of time. So what happened in those 400 years that are significant for us to move from the Old Testament to understand the New Testament? So the first thing we need to understand is the Apocrypha was written. So uh, there are notes here. You see the notes you, and you can fill in the blanks as you're able. And I'll have the blanks up on the screen as well. So what is the Apocrypha? Apocrypha means hidden. And what are these books? Are they in our Bible? No. What, what Bible are they in? They're in the, the Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. They're in, it's in the Catholic Bible. So these are 14 books between the Old and the New Testament of the history in this intertestamental time. Now, some of these books are valuable and good history, but none of them are inspired by God. That's why they're not in our Bible. Okay, so who could read? Esther, could you read letter B there and letter C in our notes, please, for us? Okay. Apocrypha, yeah. Okay, so num uh, letter B, they were never accepted as can can canonical. 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 canonical by the Jews and were not in the scriptures Jesus used. Since Jesus said the scriptures could not be broken, John 10 35, it is clear that Jesus did not accept the Apocrypha as canonical. Um, letter C, it is never quoted in the New Testament. So no New Testament author inspired by the Holy Spirit viewed the Apocrypha as can canonical. Okay, so the Apocrypha does not belong as, in the word of God as scripture. It was never quoted by Jesus, never quoted by any of the other New Testament writers. It wasn't ever accepted by the Jewish people as scripture. And there is one verse I will give you on this, Matthew 23, verse 35. We've looked at this in the past, but let's just review here. Matthew 23, verse 35. Uh, and George, could I ask you to read? Is that okay? Are you comfortable reading, but Lorraine, as well, if I called on you to read? That's okay? Okay, good. All right, so George, could you read Matthew chapter 23, verse 35? And I call this verse how Jesus is telling us the bookends of the Bible. In other words, what's the first book and what's the last book of the Old Testament scripture? Okay, Matthew 23, 35. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple of the and the altar. Okay. Now, you might not think that that verse would help us to understand that the Apocrypha does not belong in the Bible, but it actually does. Because Jesus is referring to the first martyr that you come to. If you start reading the Bible in Genesis, the first martyr in the Bible is who? He's Abel. And it's in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, right? And if you keep reading the Bible, there's many martyrs in the Old Testament. But in the Jewish Bible, the last book of their Bible, they had a different order than us. The last book of their Bible was the book of Chronicles. And that's who Jesus is referring to there, Zechariah. He was martyred in the book of Chronicles, which is the last book of their Bible. So Jesus is, Jesus is giving the first book and the last book of the Hebrew scripture. And he doesn't say it extends into the period of the apocryphal books which does tell of people who died for their faith and who sacrificed. Okay, so 
So Jesus himself is telling us what the first book and the last book. And again, the, uh, these apocryphal books were not in the Hebrew scripture. And Jesus, Jesus never said, hey, guys, you're missing some books here. You know, <laughs> you got to these books should be included. He did say the word of God cannot be broken and that every jot and tittle would be fulfilled. So Jesus believed in the power of God's word and the authority of scripture, the inspiration of scripture in that sense. And those are the books that he held to, not the apocryphal books. And that's important. Now, I'll, I'll just say this as well. You guys know who Jerome is? one of the most important teachers in Roman Catholic history, he translated the Latin Vulgate, which for years was, for hundreds of years, I'm saying, was the Roman Catholic Bible. Jerome translated the Latin Vulgate. Jerome did not believe the Apocrypha, Apocryphal books belonged in the scripture. <laughs> so... Okay, so that's a pretty strong argument. All right. Any questions? You can always feel free to just, yes. Paul? What reason why the Catholics accept the apocryphal? Okay, that's a good question. So, what are the reasons the Roman Catholics do accept the apocrypha? Well, for one, it helps substantiate some of their teachings that we don't agree with, such as praying for the dead. So that you could get from some of the apocryphal books. And there may be some other Roman Catholic doctrines that we don't agree with that they get from the apocrypha. But the apocrypha also is clearly doesn't and, and I'm not an expert on the Apocrypha, but it's not all true history either. Some of it's good history, but it, there could be errors in it. It's written by, it's books written by men. Yeah. So that's at least one reason. Just, yes, Raul? Just, a, just an opinion. So um, what would be your feeling for someone who was a, a born and born raised Catholic that came to true saving faith in Christ, rejected Catholicism, but held on to their Bible with the Apocrypha included, but at that point acknowledging, I don't believe this is, you know, I, I just ask that because I know a minister who did that. I'm sorry, he, so he was raised Catholic, for years, for but then he became saved, yep. and then he, he he rejected the Apocrypha, or he still believed he rejected the Apocrypha? Rejected it completely, okay. kept his, his actually preached from the Bible that he had since I guess he was a kid, that contained the Apocrypha. He says he used it as an example to tell me. Yeah, I, I wouldn't buy a Bible that included it, but I was just curious yeah. about that. He, he never got because he goes, well, the word of God is in there, minus these whatever seven books. I, I don't know what kind of an English Bible you could buy with the Apocrypha in it, uh, except the Roman Catholic Bible. Yeah, I think now it's like and, the NRSV Bible. The only oh, one I get, really? But, uh, he had one back then. So Raul's point was there was a man who was saved out of Catholicism, and he still used an English Bible with the Apocrypha in it. But he didn't believe it was the word of God. So I, there's no harm, no foul, I guess, you know. <laughs> but okay, the second thing here is the Septuagint. You might want to put somewhere in your notes LXX. That is the abbreviation for the Septuagint. What is the Septuagint? If you go to your Jensen on page 45. He tells us a little bit about the Septuagint. So what happened, and, and we'll, we'll see this in just a moment, is that Jewish people started to migrate outside of Israel when they were went into captivity. And so they started migrating. And at that point, the world was a Greek-speaking world. So if you were, if you left out of Jerusalem and you migrated to Alexandria, Egypt, let's say, and everybody there spoke Greek. So when you had children and grandchildren, guess what language they spoke? By the time the third generation comes around, not many would even speak Hebrew any longer. So now you have Jewish people living in various parts of the world, not speaking Hebrew, but speaking Greek. So what kind of Bible did they need? 
and needed a Greek Bible, a Bible in their language. So, so the Bible is translated from the Hebrew into Greek. And it, it note in the middle of your book there of Jensen, page 45, it talks about Alexandria was this Greek speaking city. And this translation called the Septuagint, the Pentateuch was done, the Pentateuch being the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Deuteronomy, the law, and then the whole Old Testament by 180 BC. That's underneath, if you see Alexandria in your notes, you see that? And then the paragraph, the second paragraph down, since Alexandria was a Greek speaking city, and then the last sentence of that paragraph, you see that? So. Now, the, the Septuagint is quoted in the New Testament, which is interesting. So what does that tell us, though? That God puts his approval upon translations. So that's an encouragement to me. Actually, last week in our Wednesday prayer meeting, we were talking about Philip when he met the Ethiopian eunuch. And that translation that's given to us in our English Bible, most people would say that it was translated from the Septuagint, not the Hebrew, but the Septuagint, this Greek translation. So that's an encouragement for us because we don't we don't speak. Do you speak Hebrew? George, you speak you speak Greek? I don't, any Greeks here? No, we don't speak Hebrew and Greek. We have an English translation, but a translation done properly and accurately is the word of God. And we can have that confidence that though we don't speak those original languages, we, we still have the word of God in a good translation, like such as that we use. So the Septuagint, so you need to know that. Then if you go, if you look at page 41 in your, in your uh, book, no, I'm sorry, page 43, page 43, he says there are three centers of Judaism on page 43, okay? So what's the first center? In other words, Jewish life after Israel was put into exile centered in three different major areas. What was the first major area he references in the middle of page 43? What is it? On page 43, if you see letter A, you see letter A, three centers of life. And then just slip down. You see where it says number one? Number one is Babylon. Babylon. Right. Okay. So you're with me there. Okay. So that's the first Jewish center. And basically what he says is that Jewish people were put into captivity. They migrated to Babylon. Then when some of them left Babylon to go back to Jerusalem when they were allowed by God to rebuild their temple, some of them stayed. Like today, did all Jewish people go back to Israel just because Jewish people can live in Israel? When Israel was made a state again in 1948, did all the Jewish people in the world go back to Israel? No, there's more Jewish people in New York, I think, than in Jerusalem, they say. See, so the same kind of thing happened. Jewish people migrated to Babylon, some went back, but some stayed. And then if you read the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah and others migrated. What's the second area of migration? Alexandria. Alexandria. Definitely. And that's on page 45. Good job, Lorraine. You, were on, you, you knew my question. You knew what I was going to ask. So that's Alexandria and Egypt. That's Alexandria, Egypt. Now, Alexandria was a Greek-speaking city. So look at John 7, verse 35. Lorraine, could you actually read that verse for us? It's in your notes as well. It's, you could read it right out of your notes there. John 7, verse 35. So John 7, 35 says, Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles? And the, okay, I put the, yeah, the Greek right. word there is Hellenos, all right? So yeah, you don't have to read what's in parentheses, but that's interesting, yeah? Okay, and, okay, will, 
will he go unto the first among the Gentiles and teach the, the Gentiles? Okay, so Jesus in this passage of scripture, he's really just toying with the antagonistic and argumentative combative Jewish people. He, he's, he's really just toying with them because he's, he's full of wisdom. And in John chapter 7, Jesus said, yet a little while, I am going to be with you. Then I will go to him that sent me. What was Jesus really talking about? I will go to him that sent me. Where is he going to go? Back to. He's going to go back to heaven. But they were like mocking back at Jesus. They were mocking him. He says, where is he going to go? Is he going to go? Will he go to the, to the places where the Jewish people have been dispersed? Among the Gentiles. And that's the word Hellenas. Now, that's an, that's an interesting word because what is, what is the spread of Greek culture around the world call, called? We call it what? The Hellenization of the world. When Alexander the Great conquered the world, basically his culture spread around the world, especially his, the Greek language. It became a Greek-speaking world. And it, that's called the world was Hellenized. And so we get it. That's the Greek word. And so that's the word that they use here. Will he go to the Greek speaking world? To the Gentiles. Okay, so another thing that's very important here in this migration to both Babylon and Alexandria is what began to sprout up since the Jewish people, they couldn't be in Jerusalem where the temple was. They couldn't go and offer their sacrifices. They were so far away. They couldn't go to any of the local synagogues that were there in Israel. What do you think they built when they went to Babylon, when they went to Alexandria? They built their own synagogues. So basically, during this time of captivity, in this 400-year period of time, even before the New Testament, because when we come into the New Testament, we see there are synagogues. Now, in Palestine, in Galilee, there are synagogues. Where did they come from? They came during this intertestamental period of time when Israel was scattered into captivity, migrated, and they built teaching centers in Alexandria and Egypt in Babylon. And you know what that's going to do? That is going to prepare the world for the local church. <laughs> For the local church, because when Paul then later on took the gospel around the world, where did he first go when he went to Athens and when he or, or when he went to a city that had a Jewish speaking people in it and in Corinth and in Thessalonica, where did he first go? He would first go to the synagogues. It was the natural place for him to, to give the word. So synagogues began to rise up during this period of time in the intertestamental period. Period. And the third major area, of course, would be Jerusalem. And that's at the bottom of page uh, 45. Okay. So, so here's a little map just to get us going here. If you look on page four, the Babylonian period, Israel was put into exile in Babylon. You see where Babylon here is on this on this map. I'm sorry. Yeah, in, in, yeah, we're on page four in the notes. There is, let's see. The map in your book, map uh, on page 56, it's not very, it's not very good. It's kind of it's a, it's a small map, but that's probably the best map for the for this situation. But anyway, I have a map up here on the screen. So here you see. So here's here's Jerusalem over here, right? And then down here is Egypt. And then this this area is called the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamian, this Mesopotamian region. So down here is Babylon, and even further would be Persia, back here, okay? So 
people did travel and trade. Remember when Joseph was taken into captivity, there were, there were traders going down into Egypt. So they, and there was a road and, and basically Israel, Israel was like a land bridge to three continents. It was in that little piece of land, but it was central to the world. And people would travel through Israel going south into Egypt and then going north and, and down around to the Fertile Crescent. So Israel was the center of transportation in some kind of ways. So uh, you have the Babylonian period, the Persian period, where people went into captivity and then they were led back by Zerubbabel and Ezra. Remember in the book of Ezra, they rebuilt the temple. Nehemiah, they rebuilt the walls. It is commonly believed that Ezra the scribe is responsible for organizing meetings for Bible study that developed into the first synagogues. So I already referenced that. And then, of course, you have the Greek Syrian rule. And, and I'm just summarizing some of the things that Jensen is writing here. And if you look on page number 48, this is where he references that. So Alexander the Great rapidly conquered the world, spread Greek culture called Hellenization. Upon his death, Alexander's kingdom was divided into how many parts? How many parts was Alexander's kingdom divided into? Does anybody know? Four. four. Yep, four, four different parts. Among his four generals, and, and that's in the book of Daniel as well, in the different visions that God gives to Daniel. Initially, Israel fell into the hands of the Egyptians. The, the, they were called the Ptolemies. That was the family, the Ptolemies. Then the Syrians took control. And then a monster by the name of point number three. Let's read that together. Um, Micah, could you read that point number three under letter C, Greek Syrian rule there? And then if you look in your book, I'm getting that quote from page 48. You see where it says the Syrian period. And under that, the major internal struggle of these years, that's where it says that quote. I thought that was a significant quote. Because so basically you had Jewish people who believe the Bible and Jewish people who didn't. <laughs> and there's a lot of Jewish people who don't believe the Bible. Think of how worldly some Jewish people are today. Have you heard of Jeffrey Epstein? And all of the wickedness that went on in his island. Have you heard of, um, who was the guy, the Hollywood guy? Harvey Weinstein. I mean, very many Jewish people, they're very wicked and very immoral, very, very worldly. They're not following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, they're Jewish in name, Jewish culture, but they're worldly. They've, they've taken in the world. And so you have this kind of struggle going on back then as well. And Jewish people who wanted to just be like the world and other Jewish people who wanted to be separate from the world. There's Christian people like that, people who say they're saved, but they just want to do everything the world is doing too. Other people who are truly born again want to be separated from the world. So Antiochus Epiphanes comes along and Jewish people compromise with him and he offers swine's flesh on the altar now a pig for a jewish person was what that was terribly <laughs> unclean and so he completely desecrated the temple and then that's when god raised up this priest named mattathias and his son judas and they were the maccabees and then through a war they were able to retake the temple retake Jerusalem, drive out Antiochus, and what did they do? They rededicated the temple. And this is letter D now, Maccabean rule. 
the Maccabean period. And this priest, Mattathias, his son, Judas, they called him the hammerer. And this is also prophesied in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8 actually gives the prophecy, even though, now check this out. This happened, and if you, I actually have a mistake in, in our notes. You see in this, this uh, point number one, it says the Jews retook and rededicated the temple. That's the blank rededicated, which is now known as what? Hanukkah. That's the Hanukkah celebration. And it says in your notes, I think 130, that should be 164. That's a misprint, should be 164 BC. So this is amazing because it happened during this intertestamental time, but yet it was prophesied by Daniel. And Jesus himself celebrated Hanukkah. So you can always tell your Jewish friends if you have to be Hanukkah. Because John chapter 10, verse 22, Jesus recognized Hanukkah. It's called the Feast of Dedication in our Bible in John chapter 10, verse 22. So this is the Maccabean rule, but it ended with a lot of feuding and fighting, even though it began with a, in a very patriotic time. But then people began to fight and feud and argue. So it was during this time, on page five in your notes, that Israel was divided into the New Testament divisions that are familiar to us. When we come into the New Testament times, we see Israel divided into these three major areas. Judea, which is where the temple was in Jerusalem. Samaria, which was a, a different ethnic group people with perhaps Jewish blood, but then mixed with Gentile blood. So they were like a mixed ethnic group of, of people. And then Galilee, which was in the north. And so you see those three areas in our book. And you could see it if you go to page 65 in your, if you have, I'm, I'm sorry, it, it, the map on the screen, but in your book on page 65, map uh, F there, if you could please spot on the map, and it's good to look at maps, by the way. I believe in maps. On page 65, you see Judea in the bottom. If you find the Dead Sea, and then right across from the Dead Sea, do you see Jerusalem right above Judea? See Jerusalem? Okay, you should be familiar where Jerusalem is. Jerusalem is, if you go to the top of the Dead Sea and kind of just go right across, kind of like you'll find Jerusalem. Then you see right above Judea is Samaria. You see that? If you could locate that in your map. And then right above Jude Samaria is Galilee. Okay, if you could find that. And look to the east of the Jordan River, kind of in between Samaria and Judea. You see Perea? You see Perea? The Gospel of Luke tells about Jesus' Perean ministry. Many of the famous stories of Jesus, like the Good Samaritan, like the parable of lost things, the... the um, the coin that was lost, the prodigal son. It comes from Jesus's Perean ministry. Okay, so this is a, that's a good map that you'll want to refer to. Okay, so now let's just talk for a few moments about Roman rule. Letter E on page five. Roman rule is letter E from 63 BC and throughout the life of Christ, of course, Rome was the dominant power of its day. Rome was the military conqueror of the world, but Greece had conquered the world culturally. So although the Romans were the military and political masters of the world culturally, in a sense, you could say it was a Greek world culturally. The world had been Hellenized. So that's the, world we're read, that's the world we're reading about when we read the New Testament. You know, somebody said, like, every, you know, when you read the Bible, you read the Bible in, in a sense in two different worlds. We, we read it in our world and we apply it to, to our lives because the Bible's, you know, timeless. It's the word of God. It transcends culture and time. It always relates. But yet the Bible was written at a particular period of time. So for us to best understand the Bible now, it's, it's good to understand some aspects of 
of that time, okay? So what was the Roman world like? Well, go to Luke chapter two and they had an emperor and you know this, Rome, what was his emperor called? He was called what? He's called Caesar. So look at Luke chapter two and verse one. And Charlie, could I get you to read that verse, please? Uh, Luke chapter two, verse one. Sure. So Luke two, verse one. And it yeah. came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Okay, famous verse. We know that from the Christmas story. So this is the supreme ruler of the world. That's the emperor. He was the Caesar. Okay, then underneath the Caesar, there were various kings in Israel. So look at Luke chapter three. Look at Luke chapter three and verse number one. And Charlie, why don't I get you to read that as well, please? Number two is kings. And I'll give you the blank. Number three is governors. But uh, yeah, if you could read that, Charlie, kings. Uh, Luke 3, 1, correct? Yes. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip Tetrarch of Iturea, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Abilene, Okay, thank you, Charles. That's why I wanted you to read it. There's a lot of big words there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here are some of the kings. Now, kings were the highest local rulers of the territories in the Roman Empire. In Israel, kings were of the Herodian dynasty. We often see that word Herod, right? The name Herod. Now, when Jesus was born, Herod the king, Herod the Great was king over all, all of Palestine. Matthew chapter 2 verse one, when Jesus was born. But then during the earthly ministry of Christ, Herod had died and his area, his region was actually divided into three different kings. So I think I have this here. And, and this is actually, so I wanna do this and I wanna kind of show you a little bit how this book is, is set up. This book is sometimes not just set up as it just you just read it straight, but he asks a lot of questions and then he'll say, go to this map and then he'll ask you questions. And it's actually good to sometimes just stop and follow through what he's saying and, 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 and answer the questions he's asking. So let's just do that for a moment. If you go to page 57 and I'll show you what I mean under the Kings. You see under, it says number two, the king on page 57 at the bottom, almost toward the bottom of the page, it says, study carefully the names of the kings of territories in Palestine as shown on chart 12, okay? So I'm just, this is a good example of how this book is ordered. So if you go to chart 12 and you have to look for it, but it's on page 60 and 61, keep your finger there, keep your finger on page 57 and go up a few pages to page 61. 60 and 61. Now, this is a pretty complicated chart, and you, you have to look at it for a moment to see everything what he's saying here. But if, if you look at the different columns, you'll see the event here. For example, the birth of Jesus. Look here on the, on the left-hand side, birth of Jesus. Then the next column is the emperor at the time. Who was the emperor when, at the birth of Jesus? Augustus, you see, now, now keep moving across the chart on the next page. The next column says the king. So who was the king when at the birth of Jesus? Herod the Great. You see Herod the Great. So he was the king of, over all Palestine. But then you see as well that Herod the Great, he, he died around 30, um, 30, 4 B.C., so after, just after the birth of Jesus Christ. And there were no governors at that time, no governors. So Pontius Pilate wasn't around when Jesus was born. So now if you go down after Herod the Great, what happened? His, he was king over all Palestine, right? But then when he died, his 
kingdom, if you will, was divided into how many parts? Th three. Actually, three. And, and yet, now, if you turn your book sideways, and it's Archelaus, and it's Herod Antipas, and it's Philip. You see that? And it tells you the dates. Now, Archelaus was only around for a short period of time. But if you look, go to uh, Maureen. Can you go to Matthew chapter 2, verse 22? Matthew chapter 2, verse 22. Maureen? Yes, uh, I'm here. Yep, okay. Matthew chapter 2. Could you read Matthew 2, 22? Matthew 2, 22. Matthew, verse 22. Okay. And let me just give you back. This is after Jesus had gone to Egypt. Remember Jesus after he was born because they slaughtered all the infants in Bethlehem. So Joseph and Mary took them down into Egypt. So when they're coming back out of Egypt, where should they live? Should they go back to Bethlehem where he was born or should they go back to Nazareth which was in Galilee but really their original homeland was Bethlehem so they actually thought about going back to Bethlehem so but they found out who was ruling in that region and they said no nope, let's go let's not go back there let's go let's go back to Galilee okay so there you go Maureen if you could read it Matthew two twenty two. but when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. Okay, so what does that say? That says that a man named Arch Ar uh, Archelaus was ruling in the place of his father Herod. So that's what we're looking at right here. Herod the Great had died, Archelaus took over now how long was he the king for in that area yeah not, not very long okay but it's he's in the bible isn't that amazing? so so you'll read that in the bible and you'll be like okay whoa you know but it's in the bible so uh, if it's if it's there we want to kind of have some understanding about it so now if you look here in this map or or, or oh okay okay look look on the chart go back to the chart what regions did Archelaus rule? And you look down this way. You see, you look down this way. You got to hold it sideways. What regions did Archelaus rule in Israel? Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. Okay, find that on the map that I had referenced before. Is it here? Yeah. Okay, find Idumea, Judea, and Samaria. You see that? Idumea is below Judea, and it's up here on the screen as well. Idumea is in the southern part of that orange area. It's in the orange area in this map on the screen, but it's in your book. So that's where Archelaus ruled. Now, Herod Antipas, which was going back to the verse that I had Charlie read 10 minutes ago. So this is when... John the Baptist begins his ministry, right? The verse that, that uh, Charlie read in Luke chapter three, go back to Luke chapter three, verse one. So I wanna, I'm, what I'm just trying to do, I'm trying to show you where these kings are actually in the Bible. That's why, I'm, that's why we're doing this, okay? So it says in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, which is another emperor after Caesar Augustus, and that's also in this chart, it says Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee. So Herod, look here on this chart, you see Herod Antipas? And he was the Tetrarch of, or the King of Galilee and Perea, okay? So you see on the screen, the blue areas are purple, Galilee and Perea. Now find that on your map there, find Galilee and Perea. They're not quite connected, but that's where Herod, I'm sorry, page uh, 65, page 65. Yeah, it's a fun book. That's why we're, we're, it's kind of a little exercise here. Okay, so Galilee and Perea, Herod Antipas. Then the third one mentioned here, so you have Herod, 
Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother, Philip, his brother, Philip, so remember, Herod the Great was the king over all Palestine, but he died. He, his kingdom was broken into three parts, his three sons. Archelaus, we read about him. He didn't rule very long. And then Herod Antipas and Philip, he was the tetrarch of where? Eteria and, that, right, there you go. And those areas. Now find that on the map. It's, if, if you look on your screen, if you look up here on the screen, it might be easier. It's the brownish region. The brownish region up here. Eteria is way up here. And Trachonitis is over there. I don't know if this, I don't know if it's on this book. Oh yeah, it's on this book too. Yep, Eteria, you see it. Now this area plays into the New Testament when Jesus went into Caesarea Philippi. Remember Caesarea Philippi? It was named after Philip. He was the king of that. He named it after himself. It's, it's in Caesarea Philippi that Jesus said that Peter made his great confession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay? Okay, now, go back to page 57. I would really like to finish this. So we're answering these questions. Who was the king over all Palestine when Jesus was born? That would be Herod the Great. What three kings su succeeded him? Philip, Herod, and Archelaus, right? Over what lands did they rule? We looked at that, and we looked on the map. And then the last question is what two kings ruled over Palestine at any one time, and that's later on. That's in the book of Acts. We'll just let that one go. But those are the kinds of questions he asked. You look at the charts, you look at the maps, and hopefully you have a little bit of fun there. Wish I could keep going, but you know the time. We're going to take a five minute break. We'll take a we'll take a break. Are any questions as we close uh, this class tonight? Uh, yes, Roll. I'm sorry. That would be governors. I'm sorry. Yeah, governors. Oh, and by the way, so when Archelaus, I mentioned Archelaus, he only ruled for two years in that area of Judea. He wasn't replaced by a king. He was replaced by a governor. Who was the governor when Jesus was, went through the trial and his crucifixion? Pontius Pilate, right? So, he, so there wasn't a king in Judea at that time. It was a governor because Archelaus had been deposed and Rome didn't replace him with a king, but with a governor who ruled over that region. So that's where it says in your notes, your governors, and this we'll, we'll say this and we'll be done. Uh, governors, they were rulers of designated territories, authority to tax, make judicial decisions. Pilate was the governor of Judea, Samaria, and Old Idumea. Other governors in the New Testament are Felix and Festus. So, okay, so we'll start, uh, we'll start there next week and um, we'll take a break and we'll begin our next class.